In the last chapter, we ended with quite an emotional blow up from Jen. We already knew how important her rally is to her, but we got to see a little more about how she values things and what she thinks people should do when something is important to them, how far they should go. Um, and she wasn't quite on the same page as the other third children, but she's pretty driven and she's not giving up because um, she still has three more months. 21. In February, Dad got the letter from the government forbidding him from trying to grow anything indoors. It has come to our attention that you have been purchasing excess amounts of plastic pipe, such as is used in the germination, cultivation, and development of vegetative matter in an interior structure, the letter began. Due to the preponderance of such agriculture methods in the cultivation of illegal substances, we order you to cease and desist immediately. Luke read the letter at supper after everyone else in the family had had a stab at trying to figure out what it meant. Somehow, after reading all the big books that Jen had loaned him, he didn't find the fancy word so daunting. They want you to stop, Luke said. They're scared you're going to grow something illegal. And this part, he pointed at the letter, although everyone else was at the table several feet away, and he was in his usual spot on the stairs. This part where they say, render all such materials for our adjudication, that means you have to turn over all the stuff you bought, and they'll decide if they're going to fine you or not. The rest of the family looked at Luke in amazement. Then Mark started giggling. <laughs> drugs, he said. They think you're going to grow drugs. Dad flashed him a look of pure disgust. Think it's funny? We'll see what you think next year when your feet grow and we don't have money for new shoes. Mark stopped laughing. We'll get by, Luke's mother said quietly. We always have. Dad shoved back from the table. Why didn't I get a permit? He asked no one in particular. <sighs> Maybe if I just get a permit. By then, Luke had read the rest of the letter. They don't give out permits for hydroponics, he said. This says it's always illegal. This time, he only got a glare from Dad. Luke felt his father's disappointment and seeing his parents so worried about money made a small voice whisper in the back of his head, maybe if they didn't have you, they could afford everything they want. But he didn't need that much, and all his clothes were hand-me-downs from Matthew and Mark. How much could it cost to heat his attic room? Sometimes he found ice crystals on the chair he sat in to watch the neighborhood. He tried to ignore the voice. What bothered him more was that without the hydroponics idea to keep him busy, Dad barely left the farm for the rest of the winter. Luke made it over to Jen's only once in all of February and twice in March when Dad began driving around looking for the best seed corn prices. But each time, Jen greeted him with big hugs and acted genuinely thrilled to see him. Her tantrum in January seemed forgotten. One day, the two of them made a huge mess of the Talbot's kitchen, baking cookies. Won't your parents mind? Luke asked when Jen scolded him for attempting to clean the floor with a flower handprints off the cabinet and refrigerator and stove. Are you kidding? I want this preserved. They'll be thrilled to see any sign of domesticity on my part. Domesticity, like domesticating, like calming them, taming them, housebreaking them. Another time they played board games all morning, sprawled on the floor of the Talbot's family room. The third day they just spent the whole time talking. Jen kept Luke enthralled with stories of places she'd been, people she'd met, and things she'd seen. When I was little, Mom used to take me to a play group that was all third children, Jen said. She giggled. The thing was, it was all government officials' kids. I think some of the parents didn't even like kids. They just thought it was a status symbol to break the population law and get away with it. We need to pause there. 
we already heard from Jen that, oh, government officials, they're the worst at breaking laws. Yes, we've talked about hypocrisy, um, them being hypocrites. And, you know, if, if you were told you couldn't have junk food anymore, then you found a way to get away with it, wouldn't you? If you knew you could eat junk food and not get caught? Well, these guys knew they could manage to have third kids, whether it's because they could afford the medical procedures, they could afford the bribery, they could have a third kid and get away with it. And that, to them, was a status symbol, like owning a fancy car or having a house in a certain neighborhood. You were elite. If you had this kid, you could drag around as a third child, even if you didn't like kids. And here, Luke's family is starving just to keep the kid that they love alive. What do you do at the play group? Luke asked. Played, of course. Everybody had a lot of toys. And one of the kids had a dog he brought with him sometimes. And we all took tur turns feeding it dog biscuits. These people had pets too? Luke asked incredulously. Well, you know, they were barons, Jen said. Luke frowned. He slid down in the soft couch, so different from anything in his own house. My dad says that when he was little, just about everyone he knew had pets. He had a dog named Bootsy and a cat named Stripe. He talks about them all the time. Why did the government make pets illegal? Oh, you know, the food thing, Jen said. She took a chocolate chip cookie from a pack they were sharing and waved it for emphasis. Without dogs and cats, there's more food for humans. My dad says if it weren't for the barons breaking the law, lots of species would have gone extinct. Luke looked at the cookie in his own hand. So now was he supposed to feel guilty about eating food that should have gone to animals as well as to other people? Jen saw his expression. Hey, don't go dopey on me. It's all a scam, remember? There's more than enough food in the world, especially now that there aren't enough babies being born. What? Luke asked. Well, besides passing the population law, the government went on this big campaign to make women think it was something evil to get pregnant and have kids. They put posters up in all cities with things like, Who's the worst criminal? Under a picture of a pregnant lady. And, I, I don't know, some tough-looking crooks. And then if you read the whole sign... It'd tell you the woman was the worst of all. Another one? Jen giggled. They had a picture of a huge pregnant belly with the label, Ladies, do you want to look like this? And women aren't allowed to go anywhere once they get pregnant. So now my dad told me there are so few babies being born that the population's going to be cut in half. Luke shook his head, confused as usual. So why doesn't the government take down the signs and let people have as many babies as they want. Jen rolled her eyes. Luke, you've got to quit thinking this makes any sense. It's the government, remember? That's why we've got to have the rally. Luke changed the subject as quickly as he could. Well, what do women do if they can't go anywhere the whole time they're pregnant? I don't know about humans, but pigs take almost four months to have a baby. Do the women stay home all that time? Hiding like us, you mean? Jen asked. But she took the distraction. Lots of them pretend they're just getting fat. My mom said she went shopping the day before I was born and nobody noticed. But that's my mom and shopping. Then she went off on a tale about her mother taking Jen shopping in a city ten hours away. Ten hours away? Just because she'd heard a store sold good purses there. That's probably the only reason my brothers don't turn me in. If she didn't have me, my mother would drag them around shopping. Can you see those two gorillas with shopping bags? Jen did an impression walking around with her arms dragging from imaginary loaded down bags. Even though Luke had only seen her brothers from a distance, he caught the resemblance and laughed. Your brothers would never turn you in, would they? Of course not, Jen agreed. They love me. She hugged herself mockingly and flopped back onto the couch beside Luke. Anyhow, they wouldn't be smart enough to figure out how to turn me in without getting the rest of the family in trouble. What about your brothers? They're not stupid, Luke said defensively. Or 
Do you mean, would they ever betray you? Jim narrowed her eyes, truly curious. Not now, necessarily, but say years from now. If your parents were dead, and it wouldn't hurt anybody but you, they'd get lots of money for it. It was a question Luke had never considered. But he knew the answer. Never, he said, his voice cracking with earnestness. I can trust them. I mean, we grew up together. It was strange how he could be so sure, because they barely took time even to tease him anymore. Matthew was getting very serious with his girlfriend and spent every spare moment at her house. Mark had suddenly gone basketball crazy and talked Dad into nailing an old tire rim to the front of the barn for a hoop. Luke could hear him outside, throwing balls late into the night. No matter how certain he was of their loyalty, Luke sometimes felt like his brothers had outgrown him. He missed them. But it didn't matter. He had Jen now. Oh no, poor kid had her like, what, three, four times in three months? <sighs> Luke kept Jen from talking about the rally the rest of that day, and they didn't even go near the computer. They just had fun. He crawled back to his house a few hours later, thinking that he didn't mind at all anymore having to hide. He could go on his way forever, as long as he got to visit Jen. <sighs> the leaves would come back to the trees soon and he'd feel even safer on his trips to her house. And when planting season started, Dad would be out in the fields all day, and Luke could see Jen all the time. But April came before planting season. Remember, April, the rally? And Luke is avoiding the topic. He is steering clear from it, does not want to talk about it. Um, I don't know if it's because of her outburst the last time, or is it so scary to him? But he's not going to avoid it forever, so let's see what happens next. Chapter 22. We are getting close to the end of the book, and we cannot avoid this rally forever. Neither can Luke. It, it, some, somehow they have to start talking about it. Something has to happen. So, let's go. It rained the first two weeks of April, and Luke was in a tizzy, wondering when he would ever get to see Jen again. Finally, the ground dried out, and Dad headed out to the fields to plow. Luke raced to Jen's house. Oh, good, she greeted him. You can get the advanced battle plans. I was afraid you were just going to have to pick you up Thursday night and fill you in then. Luke carefully slid the door shut behind him and straightened the blinds so he and Jen would be totally hidden. Then he turned to face her. What are you talking about? He asked, but he knew... His heart began to thump harder than it had in his rush through the backyards. The rally, of course. Everything's set. I'm taking one of my parents' cars, and I'm picking up three other kids on my way. But I made sure there'd be room for you. You should feel lucky. Lots of kids are just going to walk. We're all meeting at the president's house at 6 a.m. Luke clutched the cord to the blinds. Do you know how to drive? He asked. Well enough. She flashed him a wicked grin. My brothers told me how. Come on. She waved him over to the couch. He sank into it while Jen perched on the edge. What if the population police stop you before you get to the Capitol? He asked. Us, you mean? We? You're going to, remember? Don't worry, nobody will stop us. She giggled. I checked the national employee staffing schedules through the computer. Let's just say several of the population police got some unexpected days off. You mean you change their schedules? You can do that? Jen nodded a wicked gleam in her eye. It took me a whole month to figure out how, but you are now looking at an accomplished hacker. Dimly, Luke realized why Jen had seemed so relaxed and happy on his last several visits. They'd been vacations for her, breaks from intense work on plans for the rally. He looked closer and saw the fatigue in her eyes. She looked like a long, younger version of Mom after a 12-hour shift in the chicken factory or Dad after a long day of baling hay. But there was something more in her expression. His parents had never looked so feverishly giddy. <laughs> to translate that, 
She's exhausted. She's tired. She's worn out. But she has hope. She has excitement. And that separates her from his parents. What if someone finds out what you did and changes it back? Jen shook her head. They won't. I was very selective. I coordinated everyone's travel plans and only eliminated the police who had to be eliminated. Aren't you excited? We're going to be free after all these years. She leaned down and pulled a sheaf of papers out from under the couch. Best hiding place in the world. The maid's too lazy to clean under there. Now let's see. I'll pick you up at 10 p.m. and... Luke was glad she was looking at the papers instead of him. He wouldn't have been able to meet her eyes. Okay, okay, so no one's going to be caught on the way to the Capitol. But once you're there, at the president's house, someone will call the population police and then... Luke felt panicky just thinking about it. Jen wasn't phased. So what? She asked. I don't care who gets called when we're there. Heck, I may call the population police myself. They're not going to do anything to a crowd of a thousand, especially not when lots of us are related to government officials. We'll make them listen to us. We're a revolution. Luke looked away. But your friends, you were mad at them because they weren't into it. What if they don't show up? What do you mean? Jen's voice was fierce. Luke could barely speak for the panic welling inside him. Let's let's keep track of their emotions here. Jen is over the moon. She's relaxed. She's excited. She's driven. She just cannot think of a reason this won't work. On the other hand, Luke is only thinking of reasons why this won't work. Interrupting all of, you know, she's moving forward trying to explain what's going to happen. He just keeps stopping her. Well, what if this? Well, what if this? Well, what if this? And now she's finally losing her temper. What, what do you mean? Why would you even say somebody might not come? And now he's reminding her of the last time that she fought with people in the chat room. <clears throat> in the chat room, they were making jokes. Carlos and Sean and the others. You said they weren't taking it seriously. Oh, that... That was a long time ago. They're all on board. They're psyched. Like, Carlos is my lieutenant in all of this. You wouldn't believe how much he's helped. So, okay, 10 o'clock. Then uh, it's eight hours to the Capitol, and she consulted her papers again. What kind of sign do you want to carry? I deserve a life. Or, end the population law now. Or, this is one I found in an old book, give me liberty or give me death. Luke tried to imagine what Jen seemed to be taking for granted. He could get in a car. He'd sat in a pickup in a barn. A car wasn't much different. And for eight hours, that would be all he had to do. Sit. Not that difficult. Except that panic would be coursing through him for the entire eight hours because of where the car was going. And then to get out in public at the president's house. And carry a sign? His imagination failed. He broke out in a cold sweat. Jen, I... Yes? Jen waited. The silence between them seemed to be growing like a balloon. That's assembly. Luke struggled to speak. I can't go. Jen gaped at him. I can't, he said again, weakly. Jen shook her head briskly. Yes, you can. I know you're scared. Who isn't? But this is important. Do you want to hide all your life or do you want to change history? Luke made a stab at some humor. Isn't there another choice? Jen didn't laugh. She sprang from the couch. Another choice. Another choice. She paced and then jerked back to face Luke. Sure. You can be a coward and hope someone changes the world for you. You can hide up in that attic of yours until someone knocks at your door and says, Oh yeah, they freed the hidden. Want to come out? Is that what you want? Luke didn't answer. You've got to come, Luke, or you'll hate yourself the rest of your life. When you don't have to hide anymore, even years from now, there will always be some small part of you whispering, I don't deserve this. I didn't fight for it. I'm not worth it. And you are, Luke. You are. 
You're smart and funny and nice, and you should be living life instead of being buried alive in that old house of yours. Maybe I just don't mind hiding as much as you do, Ruth whispered. Jen faced him squarely, her gaze unwavering. Yes, you do. You hate walls as much as I do. Maybe more. Have you ever listened to yourself every time you talk about how you used to go outdoors and work in the garden or something? You glow. You're alive. Even if you don't want anything else, don't you want to get the outdoors back? What Luke wanted was to get away from Jen. Because she was right. Everything she said was right. But that couldn't mean he had to go. He huddled deeper in the couch. I'm not brave like you, he said. Jen grabbed his shoulders and peered into his eyes. Oh yeah? You dared to come over here, didn't you? And here's something. Why are you always the one who makes the trip? Ever think about that? If I'm so much braver, how come I'm not risking my life to see you? There were a thousand answers to that. Because I found you first, because your house is safer than mine, because I need you more than you need me. You've got your computer and all your chat room friends, and you go places. Luke squirmed away. My, my dad hangs around my house too much, he said. It's safer this way. I'm, I'm just protecting you. Jen backed up. Thanks for the chivalry, she said bitterly. I've got enough people protecting me. If you care so much, why don't you help me get free? You said you won't come to the rally for yourself, so do it for me. That's all I'll ever ask of you. Luke winced. When she put things that way, how could he not go? Except he couldn't. You're crazy, he said. I can't go, and neither should you. It's too dangerous. Jen flashed him a look of pure disgust. You can leave now, she said coldly. I don't have time for you. Luke could feel the ice in her words. He stood up. But go, Jen said. Luke stumbled toward the door. He stopped by the blinds and turned around. Jen, can't you understand? I do want it to work. I hope... Hope doesn't mean anything, Jen snapped. Actions, the only thing that counts. Luke backed out the door. He stood on the Talbot's patio, blinking in the sunlight, breathing in the smell of fresh air and danger. Then he turned and ran home. Oh, it happened. He couldn't avoid the topic. She brought it up as if she just assumed, of course, he was going and he said no, and he didn't really change on that. He tried to express how much he wanted to go and how he knew it was important, but just for so many reasons, he just couldn't. Dangerous for him, dangerous for his family. There were so many things along the way that he had never done before. It wasn't like taking one risk. It was like 50. Uh, think about the quote there at the end. We'd already known that Jen valued action, um, when she was talking about how she knew the printouts from the computer were true because the people that wrote those and, and published them online were taking such a risk to put them out there. So their information must be true because they thought it was worth it, you know, to possibly die for. So here she is saying, yeah, this is dangerous. Things that are worth it are dangerous but it's worth it compared to the other alternative of being locked away forever. She said, hope doesn't mean anything. Action's the only thing that counts. This is the same chapter where they said Luke recognized that look of exhaustion in Jen that he sees in his poor overworked parents. The big difference was that they didn't have any hope. So for somebody that doesn't have any, hope might mean everything. Um, so I don't know if you think Jen meant that, if she was just angry, 
if that's something else that has to do with her being rich um, and what hope means to her. But um, they all said, they both said how they were really feeling. Let's hurry up and get to 23 and see what happens next. How does she drag his butt to that rally? <laughs>